Um, yeah, hi everyone. I want to talk about why you should build uh, license management into your CI CD. I only have 10 minutes, so I'm not going to tell you how to do that, but Thomas Steinberg will do just that probably in his talk later today. All right, so I've, I think we've seen this slide a couple of times already, but the 2022 Open Source Security and Risk Report examined the results of over 2,400 uh, commercial code bases, and of course the audit came back that 97% of them uh, contained open source, and in some industries even up to 100% of their audited code bases contained open source. Um, and we're all moving fast, and in order to do so, we're relying on a lot of components, a lot of dependencies that give us that sort of commercial edge. Uh, and in doing so, we're trusting the work uh, of several strangers on the internet, and also that they understand the license that they release their uh, software under. Uh, and also that the vendors that we depend on won't change their mind as to Watch out, that's a dangerous table. Uh, won't change your mind on who can benefit from their software. So if you install Electron and you have to add 87 packages, that means 87 license dependencies, and likely every single one of that package has their own dependencies, and so their own licenses that you uh, have to comply with. And so if you, I mean, you can imagine that that is uh, non-trivial work, it can't be done manually, and if you do it wrong, it creates technical debt. Um, so if any of you was in Claude's talk yesterday, you'll recognize the little dependency graph there on the side. Um, and uh, for me, that was the first time that I saw that talk too, is like, that's just burned into your brain forever and ever. Um, Today, I want to look at some of the projects that were relicensed uh, recently, uh, how we can track and manage license dependencies uh, upon deployment, and how we can be set up to uh, deal with projects that change terms as to who can benefit from that software. All right, so my name, real quick, is Floor. Uh, as mentioned, I'm based in the Netherlands. I'm a staff community program manager at Ivan. I have no idea how that picture ended up there from last night. Um, <laughs> So at Ivan, we manage your favorite open source data tools without exploiting the maintainers or the projects. Uh, I organize a bunch of meetups, but one name that you should remember is contributing.today. Uh, a lot of the speakers and people here actually were on contributing today episodes uh, where we talk about, we do really do panel discussions about anything open source, so mental health in open source, licenses, funding, everything. Um, and in one of those episodes, we talked about licenses. Um, it wasn't the most popular episode, I must tell you. Um, but we were joined by a couple of people from the Open Source Initiative, Ethical Source mo uh, Movement, from Tightlift, and from Clearly Defined. And I learned a couple of things that I want to share with you. Like, for one, um, combining that a project can combine multiple licenses for their projects, and that I don't mean just a license for the core and then a license, different license for documentation, but like for the one project, um, which is First, mostly great for lawyers, because they get paid a lot. Um, and then also, it's not great for your end, licer, uh, end user's uh, license compatibility uh, quest. I also learned that most developers can't really tell the difference between MIT license, Apache, or you know, AGPL. And that if you're lucky, they will just pick a license that is really common in their ecosystem. And if you're lucky, lucky, that is a very permissive license. I also learned that if you're thinking about building a business around your open source project eventually, you need to think about that license that you're going to slap on your project real carefully. Because even for just a really mildly popular open source project, it's really, really hard to do relicensing of a project. Um, unless you've been using contributor license agreements. Um, because otherwise, you will need to figure out a way to contact all of your contributors and make sure that you can use their code in your new uh, under your new license. Um, also, you might be at risk that the version prior to your license change is going to be forked by a group of people um, under and then released under a more community-friendly license, and so you'll have some loss of contributors and community. All right. So, on the topic of not so open, quite recently we've seen a couple of newly created kind of open source licenses um, that in some or many cases actually conflict with the free software definition uh, or with the open source definition in that the license should not restrict any other software. Um, and it was actually a really interesting talk by Pamela uh, Chestek, who's a member of the board of directors at the Open Source Initiative and the current chair of the License Committee. Um, 
at FOSDEM this year, if you were there, uh, they introduced a proposed, some proposed changes to the license review process at the OSI. Um, and talking about evaluating whether or not there should be a process for decertifying certif uh, certain licenses, they said, that, well, that's not actually like in scope for now, but uh, did mention that just because something was, a, or a license was approved in the past would mean that it would be approved today. Um, and I thought that was really, really interesting. So they made some mistakes along the way. It's almost like they're actual humans. All right, so I promised that we would look at a couple of projects that have recently relicensed. Uh, Lightband changed ACAS license from Apache 2.0 to the BSL, the business source license, starting with ACA version, version 2.7, which side rent, no, it should be like a major release because you're breaking the API um, and you're creating community loss, right? So, but I have 10 minutes. <laughs> Let's park that discussion for the hallway. Um, and with any such change, there is always talk of a fork. Um, and I've seen people ac uh, advocate for forks that have then a um, more copyleft style license so that the original cannot benefit from any um, bug fixes that the community does for the new project. Um, and I feel like it's maybe not the most effective or like, you know, great discussion to have with your community because you're actually hurting the developers that are working on the uh, original project more than you sort of stick it to the man. All right, but uh, Aka of course did get forked and is currently incubating as PECO under the Open Source Foundation and some of the Ivan OSPO members actually are very involved in that project. And um, it being an Apache project, of course it's licensed under the Apache 2.0, so no copy left, which is a good thing. All right, when Elastic published that um, they would do a license change, there was a shockwave that went through the community. Um, in Elastic 2.0, you'll find clauses to prevent uh, hosted or managed service providers from uh, using the project. It's very much copyleft style like SSPL and prevents third parties obscuring trademark notices and branding and also can embed license keys to prevent circumvention. So the impact was that Elasticsearch, uh, Kibana, and a couple of other projects were removed from hosted service providers like uh, Azure and AWS, which was kind of the point anyway. Um, and several players eventually forked the project um, and drove OpenSearch forward as the alternative to Elasticsearch, including AWS, and yes, also Ivan. <sighs> If you want to hear more about that relicensing, Dotan talked about this uh, and how it affected uh, their business in uh, at FOSS backstage last year. Then, of course, Grafana, uh, low-key tempo relicensed from Apache 2.0 to AGPL. And if you uh, are a fan of the uh, CNCF, they will uh, they they warn you against using AGPL, saying that. Um, anyone who has third-party dependencies that um, have the AGPL license should switch to an alternative component or freeze the component at the uh, version prior to the license change. Love that you're already coming in. I'm feeling like feeling the stress. All right. Um, <laughs> License litigation uh, may end up uh, forcing you to release your software uh, under the same license as the package dependency that you use, of course, um, and other potential problems are being sued for financial liability um, or losing reputation, which is also not a great thing. So shifting left that uh, dependency and license management to the build and deploy stage prevents you from being non-compliant in production uh, and avoids a lot of hairy problems like losing your customer's trust. There is a number of open source licenses, it's 300 plus, and I think 116 of those are uh, approved by the OSI. Um, that list is ever growing, but about 20 of them make up for uh, like 80% of open source used in enterprises. So if you're an enterprise and you have sort of a deny or allow list of those licenses, uh, together with a scanning tool, that, that you can actually go a long way <laughs> uh, for sort of spotting potential problems. Or, of course, uh, SBOMs. I don't need to explain to this crowd what an SBOM is. Uh, they also list uh, licenses that govern components. And uh, a software comp uh, composition analysis tool can help you do that job. So, Thomas, you're going to talk about ORT later on. Uh, I advise everyone in this room to actually go and see that talk uh, and see how you can also include this in your pipelines. All right. 
this is also a quote from a, a call that Thomas and I had before the conference because we were we figured out we would talk, talk about a really similar thing. Um, it's, it actually turns out that both uh, Thomas and I and the or the founder and the first president of uh, the Apache Software Foundation were all born and raised in Leiden in the Netherlands. I'm sure there's no coincidence there. All right, some of the solutions that I've seen in the world, and I promise I'm getting towards the end, um, from, the, from companies trying to shield from those license changes um, are, for instance, forking or mirroring, uh, having a mirror of all of the components that you have in use, which, congratulations, now you're the maintainer of a bunch of mirrors. But also, sometimes vulnerabilities are in the code for many days, weeks, months, even years, before they get fixed. And so new releases bring fixes as well. Another, uh, another thing that I've seen in the wild is um, this example from a really big bank. At a recent conference, they showed a slide with all of the components that they have in use with those version numbers. And then I looked up the version numbers for some of the software that they were using, uh, like Splunk or Helm, uh, and they were at least uh, one major release behind, uh, which is super interesting. So I can imagine that there is like a reason for pinning your 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 uh, components, but if there's no update strategy, that's actually really really harmful. So a better idea is to recognize and support some uh, what healthy communities are. Um, there's been many talks at this conference that talk about just that. Um, and also, one of the wonderful things about open source is that we have several solutions to a problem. So make sure that you do your due diligence of some of the alternatives that you have. Might something go wrong or might a project be uh, at risk of changing their license? And of course, build license management into your pipelines and go to Thomas's talk. I think I'm very much out of time. So thank you very much. Uh, here's my contact details. Also, I have chickens. If you have any questions about chickens, come to me or karaoke, doesn't really matter. Thank you. <laughs>